Good evening and welcome to the third of a four-part series on medical ethics. Tonight's topic is animal experimentation or exploitation. And we're very happy that we're addressing this tonight because it fits with our core values. At Spirit Grow, we're very uh, certain that everything has soul. Everything in this world has its uh, godly life force and we should respect it as such. We can gain a lot spiritually from all of nature and certainly uh, animals included. And another core value is health. And we believe this not just to be something important to us, but also something imp important in how we serve God. One of our missions here is to look after the, this body, which was deposited with us, given to us to look after. Uh, and uh, when we ensure health, that is a way of serving God and respecting this gift from God. Now, I'm not going to, of course, uh, be addressing this topic, but that's just a word or two by way of uh, introduction. The program tonight will begin with a video which will look at how care is uh, given to, to these animals which are being used in research. And you may have questions or you may uh, disagree with some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, some things that the video asserts, and that's okay. And there'll be question time at the end with uh, Rabbi Kennard. It will be followed by a uh, presentation by uh, Rabbi Kennard, a uh, discussion on this topic from uh, based on Jewish uh, sources by Rabbi Kennard, who I'll, I'll introduce uh, after the video, and then uh, conclude with question time. I uh, hope you all enjoy and uh, and. Uh, this is not just a passive experience, but will, will be also an active experience and involved, especially uh, well, throughout and especially at the end uh, with a few questions. I'm a scientist and one of my responsibilities is to look after animals used for research. I also look after animals that are sick or injured that are brought in by members of the public to university vet school. Animals are my daily concern and I have the greatest respect for them. But I have two simple questions for you. You see a dog and a child on a railway line. A train is approaching fast. You know you only have time to rescue one. Which is it to be? The dog or the baby? Second question. You're the Prime Minister. Do you stop all medical research with animals and possibly let people die? And domestic animals will die too. This treatment of a brain tumour is being done to save the life of a pet dog. It's made possible only because we have medicines and anaesthetics tested on rats and other animals. The answer to both of my questions is a hard one. It's also inescapable. Human life is more precious than that of animals. In our society, we do all we can to save lives and to improve the quality of life for those that become ill. The list of killer and debilitating diseases is huge. Cancer, AIDS, heart disease and mental illness. The case for using animals in medical research to help people like these, I believe, has been well argued. At the moment, computers and tissue culture can't recreate all the conditions of a living system. Only research animals like these can do that. Here, for example, scientists are looking at fetal growth in both animals and humans. So in this program, we're not going to deal with the should we or shouldn't we use animals argument. Instead, we're going to pose a question which makes us human. Is the care we give to animals used for medical research the best that a civilised society can deliver?
We asked three young people to take a look at an animal laboratory and to speak to an animal technician. We showed them everything they wanted to see and we answered all of their questions honestly and truthfully. What you'll see is edited from two days of visits and conversations. We've included as many images and questions and answers as possible and we have not left anything out that may be controversial. Hello, nice to see you. Thanks for coming along. Thank you. All the students are typical members of your generation. They like music, fashion, cinema, video games and television. Hannah wants to make a career in medical research but wants to know more about how the animals are used. Well, I do recognise that there are a lot of emotive issues attached to animal testing. And so I'm here today to find out the most important issue about the conditions they're kept in and about the general attitude of animal technicians toward the animals, you know, whether they're given lots of affection. Two of Gracie's relatives have multiple sclerosis, a disease that affects 85,000 people in the UK. Grace is only too well aware of the need for research using animals, but is also keen to find out how the animals are treated and the sort of people who look after them. I'm not sure what I'm expecting to see at the animal facility. Um, I mean, I've seen the pictures that animal rights activists have shown on websites and on posters. I'm slightly apprehensive about the amount of space the animals will have, um, what their behaviour is like, what they've got to do, whether they've got toys um, and things to keep their minds occupied but I'm trying to go in there with an open mind and make, make my own opinions. Philip has no deep personal reason for wanting to know about animal research. He simply wants to see for himself and form an unbiased opinion. What does worry me a bit about the labs is possibly that it could be like what I see on these websites. There is a lot of horrendous things going on. I will be asking a lot of questions today because I want to find out as much as I can, truthfully, about what goes on here. First we spoke to Tim, who's a senior animal technician with one of the country's leading pharmaceutical companies. Tim's going to talk them through a videotape which shows some of the animals he works with and what they're used for. But Tim, tell us why we just couldn't go along and film in your company. Unfortunately, in the past, um, technicians have been targeted by animal rights activists, um, which is obviously very scary for them. Um, and that's why in the video you'll find that some of their faces have been blanked out as well. Okay Tim, can we have a look at the video now then please? The first one that we see are mice. These mice are used for tissue repair, which is making wounds from burns better. They don't actually get burnt, but their, their skin is, is cut and then we put uh, compounds on to make them heal. Are the size of the cages standard? Yeah, they are standard through the industry and the number of animals per cage is governed by the Home Office. And as you can see, they're all on sawdust and they all have environmental enrichment in their cages. This is to uh, encourage natural behaviour. The enrichment is a plaything, basically, for the mice to stop them getting bored. The next uh, part we will see is the cats. These cats, as you can see, are all what we call gang-caged. So they're all in a group. These cats are used for animal health studies, flea studies. Are they cleaned out regularly? And they're cleaned out 365 days a year. The litter tray is fresh every day. Do they ever get to go outside the cage? They get to go outside the cage, but they don't get to go outside the animal facility. The reason is because they can catch diseases. You have to be aware that a happy, healthy animal is a good animal to, to test animal drugs as well as human drugs on. And have they lived there all their life? They're, they are specially bred. So they a... wouldn't have any sort of distinction between like, say, their natural habitat and the animal house? No, the animal house is their natural habitat. Right. Do the scientists ever play with the cats? Not usually, it's more like the animal technicians. We encourage that to happen. Um, a happy cat is a, a good a good cat to, to work with. If you have a, uh, a cat that's stressed or angry, it will put up, obviously, chemicals within the, in the blood that could affect the, the drugs that you're actually looking at. So do they enjoy human company, or do they fear the people in white coats? They enjoy human company. This is the experimental dog unit. These dogs are used for cardiovascular work, so people with heart problems and heart attacks. As you can see, most of the, the animals are pair housed, 
Why do you do that? They are gregarious animals, they are pack animals. So why not keep them in a bigger group then instead of pairs? The bigger group causes problems. Other dogs within, within the group become stressed because they're being bullied by other ones. Do you ever give them uh, time with the other dogs? Every day we let them out uh, twice a day to ensure that they get a run with up to ten dogs. So this enables them to act normally in, in the pack surroundings but then they don't have the stress of dominance. Do they have names or numbers? They all have numbers because that's law that they have a, an identification number, but they're all given their own personal names as well. Are the animal facilities inspected? Yes, the Home Office actually inspects the facilities up to six to eight times a year, and a majority of those are unannounced. How much does it cost to maintain the average dog? It can average out at about £50,000. With these dogs, you find that they're, they're very affectionate, they're pleased to see us, and they don't mind being picked up and carried around. And with this, this dog particularly, he's got ECG studs, just like earrings. It enables us to take an ECG reading from the same spot each time, so it don't, the, the dogs don't have to be shaved or clipped or messed about too often. Also, this dog has got a, what we call a carotid loop. The carotid loop is the carotid artery which has been exposed and covered with skin. This enables us to then take blood pressure readings without having to have the dog fixed in one position and then shaved and then trying to get a, a cuff around a limb which is very 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 difficult in a dog. And as you can see with, the, with this loop it doesn't cause any distress to hold it for the dog and in fact the dogs are very comfortable with us handling it what proportion are bred in captivity? All our animals are bred in captivity. None of the animals are brought from uh, the RSPCA or dog pounds or anything like that. At the end of the experiments, how are the animals put down? The animals are put to sleep the same way as that you put a vet would put your animal, your pet animal, to sleep. So, yeah, it's through a lethal injection of uh, an anaesthetic. And how do you feel personally when you have to um, put down an animal that you've perhaps been working with for a year or so? Well, some of the animals that I work with, we've worked with for five or six years. And, yeah, you do become very attached to them. We've obviously spent a lot of time in care looking after their welfare. If I know I've done the best for that animal and that animal's done the best for medical research, then I think it's justified. Do you uh, ever have any cases where people have mistreated animals and what kind of disciplinary action do you take against them? We haven't, within my facility, seen anything, but we have in place a procedure where anybody that is seen or is known to have mistreated an animal would be um, fired, would lose their job immediately. Um, and not only that, we could have actually prosecute them. Now the mini pigs that we have here are Danish. All these pigs are used for urogenitals, which is bladder problems. The bladder problems usually occur in humans at a later date, as in older patients. So these uh, pigs stay around for quite a long time. They are a very good model to man. So rather than using hundreds and hundreds of mice, you could usually get use one or two pigs to do the same. So once again, you're reduced, you, we, we are reducing the numbers of animals by looking at different species. These animals have got what we call an IV line. Now these lines go into the pig, into a vein, because to take a blood sample from a pig is very difficult because their, their veins are very deep. Just one small operation would uh, allow us to put that in, into a vein so that we can just sample without causing any additional pain to the pig. Are they given anaesthetic? For the operations? Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Full surgical um, anaesthesia is, is is given. You wouldn't be able to operate on any animal by law without the proper anaesthesia and pain relief. I would say they'll probably give them more than what your vets would give. Because in, it's often in used relief. in propaganda by animal rights protesters that they're not given some sort of anaesthetic. I would say a majority of experiments within this country are done without anaesthetics because most of the experiments within this country are blood samples. So you don't need an anaesthetic to take a blood sample. So with regards to the more invasive procedures, the ones that were perhaps a little more controversial, um, what 
procedures do you have to go through legally before you obtain an animal to experiment on? There is many um, procedures that you have to go through. The first thing you have to go through before you get anywhere near an animal is to ensure that the reason why you're, you want to use an animal, there's no alternative. If there is no alternative, um, and you must have researched that, that then you can then apply to get a license to use an animal for a certain procedure. Next, we visited a lab where a range of animals, including monkeys, are used to test drugs. These drugs are for treating depression, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, and other mental diseases. These are all squirrel monkeys. And these monkeys, their natural habitat is South America. Now we house them in social groups because they are social animals and uh, as well as housing them in social groups we have to, if we've got animals on one side of the room, we want them to see their um, companions on the other side of the room. And rather than house them singly, when you house them in groups it just cuts down the stress level because an animal that's stressed is no use for research work. If you look in the back wall of the enclosures we've got some uh, coloured blocks, it's a bit like a, a climbing frame and it allows them to climb up the walls on to, and sit in these blocks. These monkeys always like to be above the animal technicians or the caregivers and that's because in their wild habitat where they come from in South America they, um, they live in the tree canopy and they seldom come onto the forest floor. When they're up in the tree canopy, they feel safe from predation, so in the laboratory environment, they live up high in the cage as well. What is your personal opinion of the size of the cage? Do you think it's adequate? I think these cages are excellent for squirrel monkeys. It provides a lot of vertical movement for them, and there's a great deal of environmental enrichment. I had a question on the diet. What do they eat in the wild, and how is that replicated? Yep, no, normally squirrel monkeys, which are New World monkeys, they eat fruits and berries and small insects in the wild, which they catch on the trees. In the laboratory environment, we give them pellets which contain all the nutrients the monkey needs. We also give them fruits, some vegetables, some nuts. You can see a monkey behind you there which is using a dip feeder. Now what that does is the monkey lifts up the black lever there and is able to get a syrupy solution. And what we're trying to mimic here is they normally tear away the bark of trees in their natural or wild habitat and they get a food reward by means of sap from the tree. Now obviously we can't do that with trees in the environment so we use this dip feeder. They also spend about 80% of their time in the wild or natural habitat foraging for food. So we have to make them work a little bit harder to get the food within the laboratory environment. But why use squirrel monkeys? The reason we use squirrel monkeys is that we've got a lot of historical data on these monkeys. Because we've got a lot of historical data, it means we're using fewer monkeys in tests. There's no natural lighting, so what they've done is they've made a tunnel to reflect the light into the monkeys so that they've got a normal photo period or life cycle. Is their behaviour normal compared to um, what they, how they've been behaving in the wild? We could certainly never mimic the conditions of the wild, but I would say in my experience, the monkeys here, uh, the conditions we provide them mimic most of what they have in the wild. And you have to remember that these, these monkeys weren't taken from the wild, they were bred within a laboratory environment, so they've never been in a natural habitat. If any of the monkeys get injured, um, do they get treated and then sent back into the cages or do they get put down? Yes, if any of these monkeys are sick or injured, we have a team of veterinary surgeons who provide immediate care for the monkeys. Once the monkey is, is cared for and is, is recovered, it will go back into its normal social group. These are quite large male rhesus monkeys, so they're very strong. And you can see the enclosures they're housed in. Again, we've got environmental enrichment and we've got loads of space for them as well. You'll see from these enclosures that the monkey can go from this first enclosure it can climb through here, underneath, and into the large enclosure here as well. And they've got ropes and swings and various other environmental enrichment devices. Why are these two monkeys paired together? Uh, in this particular pen, Phil, we have one very dominant animal and one very submissive animal. And in our experience, we find that that pairing works very well with the dominant, with the submissive animal. When do these monkeys become of no use in medical research? There's never a case within this facility that the monkeys are, become of no use. When they are finished on experiment, then they're placed back into the breeding colony as stud males. These are all male rhesus animals. 
How regularly are these monkeys tested on? It depends on the study. Uh, the monkeys may be tested on an individual daily basis or they may be tested weekly. It all depends on the study. Do you ever change what's inside the cages? Yes, we do change the environmental enrichment devices because monkeys can get easily bored, so we have to review our policies at frequent intervals. You mentioned that you don't breed the monkeys here on site. Yeah. Um, so where do you get the monkeys from and how do you make sure that the humane standards you have here are maintained at your suppliers? We obtain all the primates from what's called designated breeders and suppliers and these breeders and suppliers are inspected frequently by our own veterinary surgeon staff and by the UK Home Office. So we just slowly walk to this end of the pen. These are rhesus monkeys, these are old world monkeys. These monkeys are about two to three kilograms in body weight and they're about just over two years old. That's great. That's fine. There's a great deal of environmental enrichment in this room. We've got this natural light again coming through the blocks at the back. In their natural or wild habitat, they like to have water, access to water, and this is why we've put the water feature in here. They can paddle in it, they can play in the water. And all of this enrichment, it gives them vertical space to climb. They're great climbers, they're very agile. Well, because primates have feelings, um, does this mean you have to take extra care in maintaining their welfare? Yes, Hannah, primates have got feelings similar to ours, but you have to take extra care looking after all laboratory animals, not just primates, but primates are certainly a special case. The monkeys over there look like they've completely demolished the area. Why go to such an expense? Why not just build something more stable? We go to such an expense because we care about the animals that we're using for research. The technicians care and the scientists care and we've got great compassion for the animals we use, so we don't mind spending a lot of money on enclosures, even although we know they're going to wreck them. We just move them to a new enclosure and redo it again. And um, the cages here look very different from the enclosure. They're quite bare, they haven't got any environmental enrichment. Um, how long are the periods of time that the monkeys spend in these alternative cages? These cages here are used to house monkeys individually for very short periods of time while we're looking at their behaviour. So um, with these smaller rhesus monkeys, um, what tests do you do? The main tests we do are drug metabolism studies. Um, this CD player to my right, what's that? The CD player is um, to provide the monkeys with background music. Uh, there are some studies have suggested that to have background music within the, the unit makes the monkeys less stressed and much more calmer. So you've had a chance to look around today. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask me? Back in the labs, why did we have to keep changing overalls in each area? The reason we had to change the overalls is that we were going from one monkey species into another area where other species of monkey are housed and it prevents cross-infection. Why not just put research funds into alternatives to animal testing? There is already tens of millions of pounds spent by the scientific community on the development of alternatives. How often are the animals given health checks? The animal technicians are there every day, Hannah, and if there's any problem at all, they'll call the vet immediately. How do you deal with aggressive or uncontrollable animals? In terms of the monkeys, when the, the rhesus monkeys become older and they reach a, a quite a large body weight, then we separate them off so that they don't start fighting with each other and injure themselves. Are all the animals put down? Well, 87% of the animals we use for testing are rodents. And at the end of rodent testing, in most cases, the animals are humanely killed. Why? The reason we humanely kill animals at the end of the testing is we have to conduct a post-mortem examination on them and take some tissues. However, the rhesus monkeys you saw today in this facility, we um, put these back into the breeding colony as they get older, and the squirrel monkeys you were able to see are here until they, they reach a very old age. There may come a time with the squirrel monkeys when they get old and infirm that it's kinder just to humanely kill them. What are the differences in conditions in cosmetic laboratories compared with medical laboratories? It's irrelevant to what we're talking about today because cosmetic testing has been banned within the UK. Do you think then that increased transparency would reassure the public about the conditions that the animals are kept in? 
I think there is increasing transparency within the laboratory animal science industry. It's a difficult one though because some people are concerned about opening their doors to members of the public for fear of um, extremists gaining entry. And that's one of the reasons why we're making this programme, to try and pass on information. I hope that what you've seen and heard has answered the questions you may have had. No scientist and no animal technician wants animals to suffer. The welfare of animals used in medical testing is protected by the law. But, more significantly, these animals are protected by people who really care. Other people might try and tell you something different. That's their right. But, it's your right to make up your own mind after looking at the evidence. You have to decide if the care of these animals, vitally important to our own health and that of our pets, is the best that civilised society can provide. Bandit, come on. That's a good point. That's a good point. I would imagine that uh, some some felt now I feel more comfortable. Others may have felt that's not ex that not exactly how I view it, and uh, that's all okay. We definitely see from the video that the laboratories are definitely trying to get out their message that the, that uh, they take the greatest care possible. What we'd like to, what we're here for, is uh, primarily to hear. Uh, Rabbi Kennard uh, speak about a, a Torah view, a view based on Jewish values. Rabbi Kennard, as I'm sure most are aware, is the principal of Mount Scopus. He was previously a uh, principal in uh, various schools in, in uh, England, and uh, he graduated from both Yeshivat in Israel and Oxford University. Uh, is a very well-regarded and popular speaker here, and we're very happy to have him. Please uh, give your undivided attention to Rabbi Kenna. Thank you. Am I on? Testing, one, two. Yep. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to be here and be part of the Spirit Grow activities, Spirit Grow, which is such an important institution and does such a good job. And I know that in particularly because I know many of my own students find Spirit Grow to be their natural home. Uh, and I'm very grateful that it provides that facility and that environment to give young people, old people, another way in, another vista of what it means to be Jewish and to live Jewishly. So we're talking about animal experimentation, and, and the key question that was put on the flyer, which I think really is the right question, is can we use an animal for the benefit of humans? Um, and this is the key question, and from this probably everything else follows. And when we talk about what does Judaism say, well, the answer to that is found in Jewish texts. It's found in mitzvot. It's found in particularly in what the halakha says. So let's give some sort of background to this question of how Judaism views animals. So if we open the Chumash, we find a number of mitzvot that relate to animals, some of which, in fact, occur in this week's Sedra, as it happens, because this week's Sedra has more mitzvot in it than any other. We have a mitzvah, for instance, quite well known, of Shiloh HaKen, that if one comes across a bird's nest and a mother bird is sitting on her eggs or her hatchlings, and one wants to take the eggs or the chicks, one must send away the mother bird first of all. Now, at this point, let me say straight away, I think it's an important uh, way of understanding mitzvot that we do not know what the reason for mitzvot are. Um, even a mitzvah like this, we don't know for sure why HaKadosh Baruch Hu asked us to do this. And if you look in Jewish sources, particularly in some mystical sources, you'll find a wide variety of answers. And you'll also find the answer of none at all. We do this because Hashem tells us to. So before we give any sort of speculation as to what is the purpose of the mitzvah, we have to give a blanket health warning to say we never know what is the purpose of the mitzvah. Having said that, Many of our commentators, many of our classical sources will say the purpose of this mitzvah of Shiloh HaKen is to be kind to animals, is to understand that even on a basic bird-like level, 
A mother bird will be distressed at seeing her young being taken away, and therefore it is a kindness to the animal to send away the mother bird before you take away the young. We have another mitzvah in this week's Sedra, but if you see an animal which is overburdened and it's fallen down because of the heavy pack on its back, you must help that animal get up. You must show concern for that animal and help it overcome its burden. We have another mitzvah, again in this week's parasha, that says when an animal is engaged in plowing a field or harvesting a field and an animal was being used as part of the process, one must not muzzle the animal. In other words, the animal must be allowed to eat as it goes through the field. And again, assuming that this is for the sake of the animal welfare, this is for the sake of being kind to animals, we can see that being kind to animals doesn't just mean to avoid pain to the animal, to avoid stress to the animal, but to avoid the psychological discomfort of simply being in a field full of ripe fruit, which the animal wouldn't be able to eat because it were muzzled. We must even extend our concern to that degree of psychological um, damage or psychological um, impact on what the animal is feeling as it goes through the field. Moving away from the Chumash, we look in the other ultimate source of Jewish law, L-A-W, and Jewish law, L-O-R-E, and that is the Talmud, and that is the Midrashim. Now, again, it's important to note that we find lots and lots of different stories, lots of different ideas that are found in the Talmud, and some of them are contradictory, but nevertheless, a clear direction of concern for animals comes through. For instance, the Midrash tells a story about why was Moshe Rabbeinu, why was Moses selected to be the greatest prophet of all time? To be the one person who changes history, who takes the Jews out of Egypt, who receives the Torah, who teaches the Torah to the Jewish people. So there's a Midrash in Shemot Rabbah that answers the question like this, that Moshe was a shepherd. Significantly, many of our great biblical figures started their apprenticeship as shepherds, looking after animals. And on one occasion, says the Midrash, a, a kid that Moshe was looking after ran away. And Moshe chases after it. And Moshe finds the kid at a little well of water having a drink. And Moshe says to this little animal, ah, I didn't realize that you were thirsty. And he lets the animal drink. And then because the animal is tired and thirsty, in order to bring the animal back to the flock, Moshe Rabbeinu picks up the animal and carries it on his shoulders. And at that point, God says of Moshe, because you showed such concern for your flock, I am going to appoint you the shepherd of my flock. Another story. <clears throat> A story from the Talmud that talks about Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the great leader of the Jewish people around the year 200, the compiler of the Mishnah. And we're told in a story, and we don't quite know how to understand it and how literally to take it, but nevertheless, what is the message of the story? What is the story? That a calf was destined for slaughter. And on its way to the abattoir, it broke free. And it ran to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and it tried to hide in the folds of his garment. And the great rabbi, says the story, said to the calf, go back. This is what you were created for. And says the Talmud explicitly, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was punished. He suffered decades of intestinal gastric problems, which rendered him in great pain for many, many years. And incidentally, as we will see, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said was not intrinsically wrong. The, part, the calf was destined to be slaughtered. But apparently the way he said it, even when telling the calf the truth, showing a certain callousness, showing a certain lack of feeling and sensitivity for the condition of the animal was what rendered him liable to a pretty serious punishment. And incidentally, there's an epilogue to that story. And the epilogue is that he was freed from his medical problems when he did the reverse. When one of his maidservants, and he had many because he was very wealthy, wanted to beat a cat that was probably getting in the kitchen or somewhere, and he stopped her doing so out of concern for the cat's welfare. And when he displayed the precise opposite 
of that attribute which had, as it were, got him into trouble in the first place, that was when he was freed from his, I'll try and get it right, intestinal diseases. So we see clearly that there is an attitude and whether we accept, as I said before, that the mitzvot are there to teach us something or whether they're there just because God wants us to act in a certain way, nevertheless we can clearly draw a theme from the examples that I've given that we have to be concerned for the welfare of animals. And let me give you one more story which I think um, sort of concludes this collection. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, again, he appears in many of these stories, uh, entertained another great rabbi from the Mishnahic period, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. And Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair came into Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's house and he said to the effect of, Oy vey, I didn't realize what a terrible person you were. Well, what, what did he mean? So said Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, I see that you keep in your menagerie white mules. And apparently white mules are very dangerous. I don't know a lot about mules or white or any other color, but apparently they're very dangerous. So Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was a bit taken aback. This is another story from the Talmud. And he was a bit taken aback. He said, okay, well, I'll, I'll let them go. I'll, I'll let them free. To which Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair says, that won't help at all. The problem is they're dangerous. And if you let them roam about, then they're going to cause even more danger. So Rabbi Huda Hanasi said, OK, I'll have them slaughtered. To which Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair said, you can't do that either. That will cause pain to the animal. And we don't actually know what happened at the end of the story. But we see there, and the Gemara doesn't tell us exactly, precisely what we should learn from this, but nevertheless, it presents the story and the message is obvious that we, our concern for the animals, even dangerous animals, must be of the highest degree. So we get the picture. We get the picture that part of being a Jew, part of being responsive and, and, and being somebody who understands what it is to keep mitzvot, is to be sensitive to the needs of animals. And yet, and yet, there are certain things that we're allowed to do, even encouraged to do, that obviously go in the other direction. And let's just deal with the big one. There's no question we are allowed to slaughter animals for food. More than that, we are allowed, in fact, we are enjoined in the time of the temple, in the past, and hopefully in the future, that we sacrifice animals. So we use animals for our physical needs, and we use animals for our spiritual needs. The Possek says clearly, the verse in the Bible says that the earth and its fullness is given over to humankind. And everything in the world was created for us to use. Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were told, fill the world and conquer it. There is no doubt that we are given the opportunity to benefit for ourselves from anything in this world including from members of the animal kingdom. And so there is a tension. And like in any legal system, and certainly throughout halakha, throughout Jewish law, we find competing responsibilities, competing needs. And the halakha needs to find ways in order to find a balance between these competing needs. On the one hand, we care for animals, we avoid causing animals pain. On the other hand, we are able to use animals for our benefit. So let me give you four examples of how we try and meet, find a way through these competing responsibilities, the competing values. So the first is shechita itself, is slaughtering animals. So as I said, we are allowed to slaughter animals. And we have to do it in a particular way. Now, this itself is a subject of debate around the world and is probably going to become more so. But we believe, and we have a lot of scientific evidence on our side, that shechita, that the process of the Jewish way of killing animals for food, is particularly free of pain. Now, I can't say it's painless, and I think it's naive to do so, but the way we slaughter animals with one very quick slit of the key veins which leads to the animal losing consciousness very, very quickly in a very short time, 
is less painful than many other ways. I don't want to get into the great debate about pre-stunning and whether it's nicer to shoot an animal with a bullet through the brain, which often misses, by the way, and leaves an animal paralyzed but in anguish, and whether it's better to slaughter animals the way we do it. All I can say is great veterinary minds have told us that the way that the Jews slaughter animals for food is indeed less painful. And that seems to be the motivation. Again, I have to stress, because I think it's very important to do so, that even if that were wrong, even if scientific consensus came that shechita was a more painful way, we would still do it that way because that's what God has commanded of us. But nevertheless, it seems that there is significant evidence that our traditional view that the way we slaughter animals is relatively pain-free, that is scientifically correct. So there we have a way of <coughs> finding the balance between these competing values. On the one hand, we are concerned to reduce pain to animals. On the other hand, we are allowed to kill them for food. So we kill them in a way which we believe minimizes the suffering during the process of being killed. And the next area is, is a big topic, a big area of halakha which comes into play in many aspects of our lives and of course really underlines what I'm talking about tonight. The Gemara says there is a concept called Sar Balei Chaim, the pain of animals. That's how we refer to it in shorthand. Really what we mean is the prohibition against causing pain to animals. It's not quite clear what is the origin of Tsar Balei Chaim because the Gemara gives many different suggestions as to how this principle is learnt out. And uh, one of the problems when the Gemara gives many different suggestions as the source of the same thing, you have to conclude, well, we don't know really which one is right, but somehow they're all correct. That certainly, if the Gemara says there's many possible derivations of the principle of not causing pain to animals, so we can be sure that it comes from somewhere. In fact, the Rishonim, the medieval commentators, debate at length whether this idea is from the rabbis or from the Torah itself. It's an important halachic question that we ask of many situations because we sometimes need to know the relative importance of one principle when it's going to be contrasted with another. And therefore we need to know whether this has got the authority of the Torah itself or whether it was something instituted by the rabbis. Now in both cases we'd have to follow the principle but the relative merit of it and, and how heavy it is compared to other principles might vary. And there are some who say that this principle of not causing pain to animals comes from the rabbis, but the majority of classical authorities, and this is how we actually conclude, say no, it comes from the Torah itself. Again, we can't find a precise source in the Torah, but that doesn't matter. If the Gemara says it comes from the Torah, it comes from the Torah. And one of the key um, medieval commentators who is actually sort of the inspiration for a lot of the halacha that we find in the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch itself, I'm referring to the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, he says like this, that if an animal falls into a pool of water on Shabbat and is suffering and is in danger of drowning, one can carry out in the street, even if there's no Erev, one can carry cushions, etc., to put under the animal as a sort of bit of ballast to lift him up and to reduce his suffering. And that's a crucial, um, significant uh, consideration because he's saying one can do something which is forbidden rabbinically, i.e. carry things out in the street where there's no Erev, for the sake of avoiding Tsar Balei Chaim, for the avoiding the pain to the animal, because that itself is forbidden by the Torah. So in order to avoid transgressing a Torah law, we are, under some circumstances, allowed to transgress a rabbinic law. So his conclusion, which is the view of the majority of classical authorities, which is the one that we follow, is that Sar Balei Chaim is a principle that comes from the Torah itself, and the prohibition of causing pain to animals is replete throughout halakha. But, but, what do we mean by the prohibition of causing pain to animals? So for instance, um, again, I don't know very much about riding horses, but it's pretty obvious that if a horse has a rider on its back, that causes some pain. The horse would be more comfortable without a rider on its back. Does that mean, therefore, that we're not allowed to ride horses? Does that mean if we're not allowed to cause pain to animals, we can't ride a horse? Obviously not. I say obviously because 
until not long ago, Jewish society, like every other society, was predicated on using horses the way we use the internal combustion engine today. And the horse was used to pull, to push, to transport, all sorts of things, even though there's a degree of pain involved. So again, we turn to our classical authorities and we turn to Rabbeinu Nisim, the Ran, another medieval commentator, who says it like this, that Sar Chaim means we are not allowed to cause great pain, but lesser pain, minor pain, we are allowed to cause. Now, what is great and what is minor? That is something to be judged in each individual circumstance with the aid of a competent halakhic authority. But the point is this, that again we see this sense of balance. On the one hand, we don't cause pain to other animals. On the other hand, we do exploit animals. Yes, we do use animals for our benefit, as long as the pain is not so great. So let me give you the third example, which I think really codifies this principle very well. So the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, written by Rav Yosef Cairo in the uh, uh, 15th century, says that we are able to do anything to animals for the sake of healing, healing ourselves, and for the sake of other needs. So if we have a need, and certainly if we have a medical need, then we can use animals in any way. In other words, the concern for the feelings of animals, the concern for the pain of animals, is waived, is pushed aside when it comes to our needs. And therefore, he says, he gives an example, and he says, we can, for instance, pluck geese while they're still alive, because that is for the sake of our food, and therefore it is permitted. Now, the Shulchan Aruch works like this. The Shulchan Aruch was written by Rav Yosef Kaira, who was Sephardi, based in Turkey and then in what we today we call Israel. And he was using Sephardi sources and basically writing for his community. Along comes somebody called Rav Moshe Isulis, writing in Krakow in Poland, and he adds bits to the Shulchan Aruch. He adds bits using other sources, primarily those which were available to the Ashkenazi community and not to the Sephardi community. And one of the reasons that the Shulchan Aruch is the Shulchan Aruch and that the Shulchan Aruch is the fundamental source of Jewish law is precisely because of the interplay between the two, between Rav Yosef Kaira's comments and Rav Moshe Isseli's comments. And they don't, it's not an issue just of Sephardi versus Ashkenazi, it's an issue of one perspective versus another perspective, one perspective informed by certain sources, another perspective informed by other sources. And when Rav Yosef Cairo says, we can pluck feathers from geese while they're still alive, the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isseli's, adds there, but we don't, because it's too painful. Fascinating comment. And between those two comments, you can see beautifully the synthesis of these ideas. Number one, we're allowed to. But number two, we don't, because we can avoid doing so. Now, I keep having to say what I don't know. I don't know much about plucking geese either. But I guess you can pluck geese when they're dead, as well as you can pluck geese when they're alive. And therefore, I'm assuming that part of the motivation, at least, of Moshe Isleys is one can achieve the same result with less pain. And if one can achieve the same result with less pain, then one should do so. Which brings me to the fourth example, which is why we've come here tonight. So the fourth example is the issue of animal experimentation. Can we exploit animals? Can we cause animals discomfort? Can we cause animals pain in order to further our scientific knowledge? So one of the key sources on this is one of the oldest sources. It goes back to the 17th century, when the Shvut Yaakov, a great rabbi from Austria, a great halachic source, was asked this question. Can we test medicines on animals? And he said, yes. And he said, yes. And he gave some reasons. One reason is, uh, and again, this might not apply to every experiment, but the animal won't feel pain immediately. It's not like taking a, uh, injuring an animal straight away. If you feed an animal some medicine, there may be some side effects, but they will not become immediately. They will come after a while. But the other reason that he gave is going back to this principle. Can we use animals for our benefit? Can we use animals, certainly, to enhance our scientific knowledge and hence improve our ability to heal people? 
Yes, we absolutely can. Yet, yet he brought in another caveat, actually in a different teshuva, in a different response to a different question. He gave two important conditions on this principle. One, he said, that we are allowed to experiment on animals if the increase in our scientific knowledge is going to be significant. In other words, we can't just do it willy-nilly. We can't just experiment on animals for something that is marginal in terms of increasing our scientific knowledge. It has to be something significant. And that actually relates closely to the second point that he raised, that it can only be done if that knowledge could not be obtained in another way. What do I mean in another way? Well, obviously it varies from circumstance to circumstance, and we can't give specific rules for each case. But we can say, for instance, if that same scientific knowledge could be obtained by treating the animal in a different way, in a way that doesn't cause pain or causes less pain, or not using an animal at all, but using some chemical device, then experimenting on animals would be forbidden. And it also leads to another point, which I think is very pertinent today and to the, the scientific industry. And that is this, that if that knowledge is already available through other sources, that would prevent us from being able to use the animals only to confirm what we already know. Now, how does this translate into modern terms? Um, I stand before you not as a great halakhic authority. And indeed, because these questions involve shikoladat, involve carefully analyzing what exactly are the conditions in each case, such questions would have to be asked to expert halakhic authorities. But if you take today's situation, I think it is clear that testing animals, using animals for the sake of cosmetic production, would be forbidden. I'm not authorized to give a blanket permission or a blanket refusal, but it seems to me, from the sources that I'm aware of, that when we say we're allowed to use animals and to cause pain to animals for our need, that would not extend to getting a better shade of eyeshadow or a longer lasting uh, aspect of makeup. That would not be included in a permission to use animals for experimentation. What clearly it would include is using animals to experiment to find better medicines, to find better ways of treating human beings, to find better ways of healing ourselves. But, but again, then we have to remember the other two points. That number one, that the experiment has to be designed in a way that is going to yield significant scientific knowledge. And number two, it's not information that could be obtained elsewhere. Now today, the way the scientific industry works is that one group of scientists in one part of the world will do an experiment and they'll achieve a result, and others around the world will deliberately copy that experiment to see if they can verify the same result. Now at this point I have to say, I don't know at what point that becomes knowledge that's already there and therefore knowledge that would not justify further experimentation on animals. It's not simple enough to say, well, if one group of scientists has already achieved this result, then that's it. No more experimentation, because that's not how science works. Because something is not verified, something is not concluded, until it's the same experiment has been reproduced and the same result has been found a number of times. However, there is a limit. And again, this is what would have to be decided on each individual basis. There is a limit, and I think it is possible under some circumstances to say, no, this experiment is not going to yield new knowledge. This experiment is not going to yield knowledge that is not already available elsewhere. And therefore, the exp animal experimentation would not be permitted in halakha. And so to conclude, we have here these different values, each of which comes from a Torah source. And the object of halakha, particularly at what we might call the cutting edge of halakha, applied to new situations, applied to new scientific instances, is to find a path between the two. On the one hand, it is very clear that we as Jews are commanded to show concern for animals. As we read, read every day in the Shema, as we read in the Torah a couple of weeks ago, Hashem says, I give grass in, my, in your fields for your animals, you shall eat and be satisfied. From this we learn the halacha, 
the halacha that one should feed one's animals before one feeds oneself. That is perhaps a prime example of how we are enjoined to show concern for animals. At the same time, at the same time, we show concern for ourselves. We show concern for ourselves in bettering the world. We are commanded to make the world a fit place for ourselves in which to live. We are commanded to find cures for diseases, to conquer nature in that respect. And part of the process, and we can see this today, part of the process in the way that we do find cures for diseases is we use animals. We use animals in a way which is sensitive. I was pretty impressed by what we saw on the film. I hope it's true. I hope it's the full picture that we look after animals and even while we are breeding them for experimentation, we ensure that their lives are as literally as happy and as pain-free as they can be. That's part of the process. That's part of how we show concern for animals. But at the same time, if you like, is the bottom line, the very question, are we allowed to use animals for our benefit? Absolutely yes. We are allowed to eat animals. We are allowed to wear leather. We are allowed to use animals in experimentation. But in every case, we, eat, we slaughter animals in a way that minimizes their pain. We treat our animals in a way that minimizes their pain. And if we are the sort of people who do experiments on animals for a particular need, for a particular critical need, then yes, we do so, but at all times in a way that minimizes their pain. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank, thank you, Rabbi Kennard. It's always lovely whenever I've heard you, and uh, this is a little token of thanks. Thank you very much, Luke.